so I would like to thank uh, Selvi, Roy, Sylvia, and uh, Sriram for joining us as panelists. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Dr. John Stolein, uh, Mr. Charles Butt for the grant, Angela Deal, uh, who is an amazing medical illustrator, and my institution for helping me with the Zoom presentations. So well, one of the things you probably have figured out uh, uh, based on my last uh, week's presentation is I'm going to follow the same pathway for every polyp uh, resection, right? We need to first evaluate the polyp, uh, figure out whether it is benign or not before we cut, then inject, resect. And as part of the resection, you should be prepared to deal with complications of resection, i.e. bleeding and perforation. And following that, uh, you ablate uh, the edges to cut down the recurrence and the close high-risk uh, defects, especially right side, large ones, those on antithrombotics to prevent delayed bleeding and get into the habit of putting a tattoo in certain areas that is above the rectum and above the cecum and then retrieving and looking at the pathology and planning the next step. So we follow the same pathway so that as we see polyps, uh, we go through this and then uh, get into the habit of managing them well. So uh, here is a case. Uh, this is a, a lady in her mid 60s, uh, treated for melanoma uh, of the eye about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, she had a PET scan as for a follow-up for some reason that I don't remember. And the PET scan was positive in the rectum. And then she came for colonoscopy. And actually this case was uh, done about uh, 2012 or 13. Uh, so you see the lesion and uh, uh, so I will request uh, uh, the panel to discuss this and maybe uh, Selvi could uh, open up the poll as well. Uh, you saw the lesion and uh, what do you think is this lesion? Uh, Raju, can you make me a co-host so I can uh, maybe see that there's a poll? I thought that I did that one second. One second. Yeah, sorry about that. I thought that I did. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So is this a pedunculated polyp? Is it a sessile polyp? Is it a laterally spreading tumor, granular type? Is it a non-granular laterally spreading tumor or is it a mixed type? So, all right. So 25% said it is a pedunculated polyp. 25% uh, shared it was a sessile polyp. 8% laterally spreading tumor granular type, 8% non-granular type, and 33% laterally spreading tumor mixed variety. What I would like to do is I would like to escape from here. Uh, uh, so this was actually a sessile polyp. I was trying to get back to the previous video. Uh, let me see if I can get back to the previous. Okay. Uh, maybe Sylvia can comment on this. I wish I had a longer video. I don't have a longer video. So, and uh, so this is a non dependent position, actually. Okay. So, uh, I, I can't visualize a pedicle. 
to me, this is indeed um, a large uh, sessile uh, lesion. And if I look to the microscopic appearance of the um, uh, epithelial surface, um, I see areas with the uh, white uh, tubular structures surrounded by um, uh, brown structures, so uh, compatible with adenomatous uh, tissue. But um, at uh, nine o'clock, from nine to three o'clock, I see typical villous appearance. So this might be a tubulovilus um, uh, adenoma. Uh, and uh, of course, we can't um, differentiate uh, between low and high grade dysplasia, but in my opinion, there are no visible areas with um, amorphous pattern or uh, no other signs uh, of um, submucosal invasion. So I think that uh, this is um, a sessile tubulovilus uh, adenoma. And again, it is possible that um, uh, behind the sessile uh, lesion, sometimes in our experience when we remove such lesion and we don't look carefully um, at the proximal side of the lesion, there might be sometimes um, a flat component. So I, I may, maybe this was the thought uh, for which some of us um, uh, chose for mixed type, lateral spreading mixed type, but to me is a, uh, a clear sessile poly. All right, I, I fully agree with you. I wish I uh, shared a longer video. Uh, this is the video that I had. So this is a sessile polyp. And uh, uh, for those of you uh, who are attending as technicians, if you think about a, like a mushroom with a stalk, mm -hmm. that is a pedunculated product. And you cut off the stalk and it's just the head of the mushroom, that is a sessile polyp. And if you take a hammer or something else to uh, hit on the top of that mushroom and you flatten it, that is a flat polyp. A flat polyp that is larger than 10 millimeters is a laterally spreading tumor. If it looks lumpy, it is granular. If it is smooth, it is non-granular. And if it has a mixture of granular, non-granular, sessile, it is called mixed type. So the next is, how are you going to resect this lesion? Cold snare resection, hot snare resection, endoscopic mucosal resection, endoscopic submucosal dissection. Roy, what do you think? What would you do? I would do an EMR. Mm -hmm. uh, I think here uh, what you need to be looking at is that uh, the fact that um, when the lesion is sessile, there is a possibility that the cancer actually, that there could be a focus of cancer, uh, that mm -hmm. the surface examination uh, does not uh, detect it. The reason is that uh, it could go from the inside part of this uh, uh, phyllis part. Uh, so we, we know that uh, I think uh, data from the Japanese, for example, show that, uh, that the accuracy of just looking at the surface is lowered uh, or the sensitivity is lowered. Um, uh, the other thing about uh, cutting a sessile or what we call as uh, polypoid lesions is that they uh, would have a larger blood vessels. So if the lesion is flat, then you don't really need a big blood vessel to supply the mucosa. Well, if the lesion is uh, like a mushroom or a sessile lesion, uh, then you would need a larger uh, blood vessel. So you need to be very careful uh, you mm -hmm. need to be very ready uh, that they may be uh, bleeding occurring during the resection. Okay, let me ask you, why not just hot snare resection? Um, I think uh, 
there are a few reasons. I think uh, it is much easier to uh, uh, to ensure that the resection is clear uh, because uh, you will have a plane uh, that you will see after you cut it. And uh, the risk of uh, causing a thermal injury, uh, which is uh, not very well discussed. We talk about uh, like uh, all this uh, complication as uh, that we by accident cut into the muscular protea, but there's also thermal injury, which uh, uh, would uh, have a higher risk uh, if you are cutting something big. So why not uh, just uh, inject a few cc of saline uh, and uh, make it uh, easy, make it safer, make it uh, uh, very uh, discernible that you have cut, cut it well and then be done with it. And why not uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection? Um, I, I truly believe that uh, maybe because of my training in uh, health uh, services research, uh, is that uh, you need to uh, uh, decrease the cost of endoscopy. Uh, I was listening to your discussion, for example, with your with our colleague uh, from Chile. I mean, they 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 have limitations in performing uh, endoscopy that's very costly. And here, uh, you know, we should be uh, more responsible. Uh, that when we perform something, it is actually uh, uh, cost effective. Uh, we cannot just be saying, well, we have everything uh, that we would want, so let's just open it and just, just cut it. Uh, I think uh, this is something that's achievable. So you should really uh, try to uh, find the safest and yet most effective uh, technique. And there, there should be uh, one like that. Of course, you can cut it uh, by, you know, by uh, ESD, but uh, this is a very simple few minutes job. Uh, doing an EMR is much faster than doing an ESD. Okay, that's good. In addition, yeah. All right. The next is, so you decide to do the EMR and uh, what is, we have several solutions that uh, we can use. Uh, you could use saline, epi, and dye. And dye could be methylene blue or indigo carmine. And or you could use <clears throat> heta starch, epi, and dye. Or you could use orice. Or you could use elevu. Or you could use uh, hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Selvi. Any comments on this? Roy, what do you think? I think, um, I think your choice is good. Uh, typically, uh, we don't add happy. Uh, but in this case, if you feel like, oh, okay, uh, maybe the risk of bleeding is higher, I need to add a little bit of happy. Uh, that is good. I don't know about the data of this, but... Uh, uh, we uh, used to use EPIs for, uh, in the beginning, in the early 2000s, maybe, uh, whenever we do a EMR. And then we found that a small percentage of patients uh, develop uh, abdominal pain, uh, which we thought uh, uh, was due to like some kind of an ischemic event from the EPI. So then we said, well, why not just uh, do uh, using... Uh, uh, saline alone with dye. Uh, the advantage of uh, using epi is that uh, maybe it maybe it uh, decreases the risk of bleeding, but the disadvantage is that uh, it decreases the risk of bleeding uh, because you really would want to find the bleeding site uh, and uh, treat it time so that the, perhaps the risk of delayed bleeding is less. So uh, we uh, haven't used uh, Epi for maybe 15 years, I think, at least. All right. Uh, Sri Ram, what do you think? What would you do? I you think do? that um, I would use um, Epi and 
um, just a little bit, a few drops, just to, uh, sometimes during um, insertion of the scope, you see such a large leak and injection with um, a little bit of uh, epinephrine uh, in this um, uh, mix with saline and, and uh, dye, they shrink the lesion. So when you remove it, it might be a little bit easier to capture. But again, this is not a rule. It's sometimes handy to inject during the insertion and um, remove the lesion with less difficulty during withdrawal. Frida. Yeah. Uh, personally, anything uh, above two or three centimeters, I use a one in 100,000 uh, 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 saline with uh, epinephrine. And uh, typically, I don't use any of the other uh, substances, although I've used time and uh, time to time. Uh, I never found them comfortable for my purpose. Uh, less than uh, two, three centimeters, I just use saline. More than uh, two, three centimeters, I use uh, one in 100,000 AP in small volumes and then supplement it with more saline injection. That is how I try to mitigate the risk of uh, what uh, uh, what is being discussed about these ischemic events? There are there are a couple of case reports here and there about myocardial infarction uh, uh, following even uh, one in five hundred thousand epinephrine, but in that case, uh, it, the volumes that were used were huge, and that is how uh, that that's the way I balance the risks. Uh, one second. Yeah. Uh... One second, let me. I want to invite uh, Chris uh, Raghunath. Uh, Chris is uh, the chief of uh, GI and uh, joining us from Perth, Australia. Uh, Chris, what do you do? Thanks, Maur. Uh, Raju, uh, it's an interesting topic. Um, so uh, we reported a case of um, acute MI following um, injection of uh, adrenaline with mixture of gel fusion and indium comment, which uh, I've been using for a while in a patient um, who was known to have ischemic heart disease, but um, has been stable and uh, he never had any anginal problems for quite a number of years. But um, as one of the other participants uh, said, uh, high volume was used because it was uh, quite a big polyp in the rectum that was resected. And he developed ST changes um, in the recovery and then went on to have an MI which needed a PCI. So since then, I don't um, really use epinephrine or adrenaline. Uh, I very rarely use it. I uh, tend to use um, gel effusion, which is available in the UK and in Australia, um, which is basically a fluid uh, expander with what we use for um, um, in the uh, IV uh, infusion setting, uh, mixed with uh, inucamine. Uh, very rarely I use epinephrine unless if there's issues with visibility in the resection. The reason why I do this is also because once I had, <laughs> had an endoscopic resection in the cecum uh, and uh, he had developed uh, signs of perforation and when they did the uh, surgery, it was noted that there was a lot of ischemic changes around the bowel wall. So those things have made me think, especially in elderly patients when they do um, EMR, I don't tend to mix, uh, nowadays I don't tend to mix adrenaline. I just simply use either saline or uh, gel effusion mixed with indigo Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add one more? Yeah. Yeah, that was an ex excellent point, uh, uh, giving opportunity to qualify what we are all saying. Uh, of course, the background of the patient and previous ischemic events is uh, very important, and I do keep that in mind when I decide when to use. And the another situation where I use is a very large, uh, bulky polyps to, um, I don't know if there is a evidence base for it, but uh, injecting uh, a, even a dilute AP can uh, induce vasospasm and makes it easier for uh, 
uh, putting the snare around. Uh, that is another place where I use. Honey mm-hmm. India Park. Oh, yeah. Honey hmm? India Park. Okay. All right. My Honey India Park. Do it all, man. My God. Yeah, kid, no. So let's uh, look at this. You know, we uh, injected uh, saline with uh, AP, uh, one in a hundred thousand, and along with uh, uh, indigo carmine to lift the lesion. And as you can see, the effects of uh, vasospasm already happening there. And then uh, you decide to use a snare and uh, let's see what you would use, what settings you would use. You know, post coagulation, soft coagulation, endocut Q313, endocut I315, All right, so 4% said uh, post coagulation, 13% said soft coagulation, uh, 70% majority picked up endocut Q313, and uh, 13% endocut I315. You know, I think you could use post coagulation. This, I think it will work, but you will have a much deeper thermal injury. Uh, soft coagulation I- has no cutting ability. So soft coagulation will not be able to cut through this pallet. Uh, so that's uh, not the correct answer. And the endocut eye setting is so uh, the OB uses that setting for uh, either needle knife or a sphincter tone, uh, but not for a snare. For a snare, you need to use endocut uh, Q. And uh, I can would... I add a point here? Yeah, please. So, uh, part of the reason maybe some of the people are uh, uh, clicking on forced coagulation is the the difference in the generators. If you are not using Airby, if it is an Olympus uh, 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 electro generator, it doesn't have these endocut options. It has forced coagulation uh, one and two or soft coagulation. And uh, then you have no choice but to ch- pick forced yeah. coagulation. You could use a forced coagulation. You know, for a long time we use forced coagulation. Uh, but uh, of late, people started using this, uh, uh, the newer setting by the Irby machine. Uh, so there's not, in, in the recent paper from uh, Heiko Paul, uh, they didn't see much difference between post coagulation or endocut uh, Q. All right. Uh, Raju, uh, can I comment on that? Yeah, please. Uh, the current Olympus generator uh, has got the uh, pulse cut mode, which is the equivalent of endocut. Uh-huh. So uh, you can use the pulse cut fast, pulse cut slow. Ideally, pulse cut slow will be the ideal one about, I think, if I remember right, I used to use it in Nottingham. So uh, it's nearly a year since I used it, about 20 or 30 watts, if I remember right. And pulse cut slow will be ideal for uh, these sort of situation. That's an equivalent to endocut in, in Olympus. Now. That's the latest generator. Oh, that's good. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Right. So one of the points that I want to share with uh, the trainees is make sure that your electrosurgery unit is in front of you so that you can see the settings before you start applying uh, the current. And as you know that the yellow pedal is for cut or endocut and the blue pedal is for post upper coagulation. The blue pedal is also used for soft coagulation. It's also used for APC. And uh, I would like to take a few seconds to just remind us about endocut effect three, duration one, interval three, right? These are the settings and what do they mean? If you have a setting one, you don't have any coagulation effect. It is a pure, almost works like a pure cut. And uh, as you increase the settings to two, three, or four, there is more coagulation as you go up, as you can see this. That's one concept you want to keep in mind. And recently, uh, I had a patient with a tethered polyp because of scarring, and I used the endocut uh, uh, Q setting one to have a pure cut 
that could cut through the scar tissue. And it actually worked well. You know, I just did uh, this thing, this type of setting only for the last two patients with scarring and it worked well. I just wanted to share with the group. The second one is uh, duration, the cut duration. As you can see here, there are four settings. Uh, in one setting, setting one, you cut for a very short duration. As you increase the setting duration, with setting four, you cut a much longer length of the polyp in one tap. So something to keep in mind. And if you want to have much control cut, keep the duration to uh, just one. And then the interval, uh, here the interval is three. Uh, that means interval three is about 720 milliseconds in between the cuts. So if you have a small polyp, uh, you could go with the setting of three uh, because this is the amount of duration of coagulation that will be happening. But if you have a large thicker polyp, it is probably a good idea to increase the interval to four or five or six so that you have longer coagulation in between the cuts. And uh, the longer interval, interval of five or six, is something you want to choose if you are worried about thick blood vessels uh, in the stalk of the polyp and you want to make sure that there is enough coagulation. So something to keep in mind. I just wanted to people to get uh, this information clear uh, when they're doing their cases. So we decided to cut with the uh, uh, endocut Q313. We use a, uh, a 20 millimeter snare and uh, uh, we tapped on the, uh, we used the yellow pedal uh, to cut. And when you're using Endocut Q313 or whatever, uh, you want to keep your foot on the pedal and not tap tap. When you do tap tap, it is almost like a pure auto cut. So this is uh, what's happened, you know. Uh, the patient started bleeding and uh, how do you want to control this bleeding? So we have epinephrine injection, thermal hemostasis, uh, mechanical hemostasis. In a thermal hemostasis, you have two options. You could use a, a coagulation uh, of, uh, forceps or a hemostatic forceps with a soft coagulation or you could use a snare tip and have a soft coagulation. Uh, those are the two options. And then you have mechanical hemostasis uh, with the clips. You know, when you're doing a, a particular case, you know, any of these options are reasonable. So the people actually picked uh, epinephrine injection 4%, thermal coagulation 74%, uh, they must be thinking about either a hemostatic forceps or a snare tip coagulation or mechanical hemostasis with clips. So let me ask the panelists what they would do. Sylvia. Well, uh, firstly, try to visualize the origin of, uh, of the bleeding uh, to visualize vessels so washing out and um, getting closer to better inspect if possible to um, to detect the the cause of bleeding and um, assuming that a visible vessel is uh, detected then i would use a combination between thermal coagulation uh, and um, and uh, clipping okay so this is what we did. I think uh, uh, we used a clip and uh, we thought that we were very close to the blood vessel and uh, this is what's happened. So at this juncture, uh, what do you do next? Let's see, do you deploy the clip? Uh, and apply more clips around the site. 
or you reopen and reapply the clip. All right. So about a third said deploy the clip and then they want to uh, apply some more clips. I think that's not, not an unreasonable game plan because you have a big bleeding vessel and uh, that's one option. The other option is uh, you're not happy because it is continuing to bleed uh, despite the closure and clip tamponade. And uh, you may want to tell uh, your assistant to reopen and then you mm -hmm. try to reapply the clip. Roy, what are your thoughts? I I, I think um, if if you are not sure, um, I think uh, to uh, maybe uh, use your water jet and uh, take a look quickly, and then uh, you know adjust the clip would be would be good. But uh, Doing it uh, and just uh, applying the clip uh, as long as it's close by is also not a, not a bad uh, option because the first clip uh, will always help the second, uh, the mm. deployment of the second one because the first clip will tent the tissue uh, and presumably it was close enough. And uh, by tenting it, then uh, putting the second one would be easier. Okay. So one thing is uh, some of you may say that we, could, we should have used a, a coag grasper or a hemostatic forceps with soft coagulation. Uh, so this was in 2012. At that time, we didn't have access to that uh, instrument. And if that instrument is available, uh, that's one, one way to go. If that instrument is not available, uh, you could still use the clips to figure out. Uh, the other thing is uh, you, you may or may not have observed that there is still some residual polyp right. okay. around the site. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, that's right, right. So Sylvia, you want to comment on that? Yes, at uh, seven o'clock, I saw indeed some residual adenoma. So this, uh, this uh, makes the procedure a bit more complicated because once we apply the clips, that will be uh, more difficult to remove the um, residual adenoma. I'm not sure, but it's right, a, right. that might be, that might be a right. that factor. That was one of the thoughts that was going on in my mind at that time. So, uh, so this is what uh, we did. We, we said uh, we didn't catch the vessel and let us uh, reapply the clip. And uh, I should tell you this happened within the first year or two after joining MD Anderson. Uh, you know, most of these cases when they go wrong, they go wrong when you're really tired and at the end of the day. So this was a case that I was doing at six o'clock. And while I was struggling, my boss, John Stoline knocks at the door and comes into the room. You can <laughs> All right, so, so we reopened the clip and then we decided that, okay, it is a little bit uh, to the left. We went to uh, the first application was a little bit to the right and uh, we wanted to see if we can readjust and uh, apply the clip a little bit to the left and see whether we can uh, uh, obtain hemostasis. So as you can see here, we were able to obtain hemostasis. And what I've done is because the polyp is still there, residual polyp at the edge, as you can see here, I basically closed the clip and told my assistant not to deploy and waited for five minutes. Actually, we, we said, okay, let's sit tight here for five minutes to apply tamponade and five minutes for the clock to form uh, so that uh, I could reopen the clip uh, and then deal with the residual polyp and then close the defect. So that was my thought process. And uh, interestingly, 
uh, after five minutes of closure and uh, reopening the clip, there was no further bleeding. I want to make one point for the sake of uh, trainees and, uh, and my assistants. Uh, I'm fortunate to have good assistants. They know how to uh, deploy the clip. So for trainees who are working with uh, uh, their assistant, you need to understand that and tell your assistant that you have three steps in clip application. Now open the clip, close the clip, and deploy the clip. And uh, you should, uh, you know, most of the time when you say open, they will open. And when you say close, you tell them to just close, but not deploy the clip. That is very important uh, point so that uh, if the assistant uh, deploys the clip and you have not controlled the bleeding, uh, especially in this case, you would be struggling with this uh, uh, residual polyp that is stuck to the wall later on. So you have to tell your assistant, open, close, and when you say deploy, then only they deploy. So that is an important point to keep in mind. So we went ahead and uh, resected the remaining uh, polyp. And uh, it's important to make sure that you resect the remaining polyp completely and uh, make sure there's no visible residual polyp. And uh, do not get into the uh, idea of trying to ablate this with APC because you cannot really ablate this and the polyp is going to come back. So any thoughts on this, uh, uh, Chris? All right. So in terms of preventing the recurrence, what are we going to do? Are we going to do a little more extra margin cut or whether we're going to do soft coagulation with a snare tip? Uh, or APC uh, with post-coagulation. Uh, basically, whether you're going to cut more or whether you're going to ablate with the thermal modalities. All right, 17% uh, share that extra margin cut, 44% soft coagulation, and 39% uh, APC. So Sridham, what would you do? I am a little cheap, sir. I use soft coagulation uh, with using the same snare and uh, uh, ablate the margins instead of using an, another form. Uh, I think we got uh, good uh, uh, t visible tissue control. I don't, I, at least from the last uh, glimpse, I didn't see much of uh, additional tissue. So extra margin cut only increases the more bleeding chances. Okay. Uh, what settings would you use? Uh, for ablation and, uh, uh, and also for uh, hemostasis, I use uh, soft coagulation 60 watts. Okay. And uh, Roy, what would you do? I think um, you um, you have uh, discussed it uh, that uh, you would want to ablate if there is any macroscopic visible um, lesion. So uh, you got uh, that nailed. And um, uh, whether the choice of uh, using the tip of um, snare or the APC. I actually, I'm not familiar of, uh, I guess there is like uh, both, uh, I guess there's enough evidence for both. Um, I just would want, like to caution that uh, here uh, the choice is uh, really of the choice for an expert to be doing it and the choice of uh, something that probably can be uh, generalizable to more people. So uh, when we are in a teaching institution, uh, we would want to teach something that 
that the trainees can uh, bring to their uh, future job. And uh, when we uh, start using something that uh, could uh, injure the patient when there is uh, mortality, uh, because we wanted to uh, save the, the last few dollars, um, I, I think that is probably not as wise. So my choice would be uh, to use APC because uh, APC is known to uh, ablate uh, very superficially. And I would go with, with uh, something like that. Um, uh, but that's, you know, uh, I think uh, it's a safe choice. Uh, uh, using the tip of the snare, I mean, if you make an, an accident, uh, then uh, it is really not a good idea uh, for somebody. Raju was just talking about like how he was starting up, up in, at MD Anderson and having something like this. Now, if you were a trainee uh, and you are uh, using this and then you cause a coagulation necrosis or a frank perforation, uh, that would be detrimental to your career. Uh, so um, use something that's uh, safer and has a track record uh, is, uh, is perhaps the way to go. Uh, why do we want to uh, make uh, EMR, which is uh, really... Uh, a uh, research for uh, cutting something that's uh, significant and uh, why we want to make it into like a uh, so cheap uh, I have no clue uh, uh, I mean we are cutting something that's uh, has a significant uh, potential for malignancy uh, we should be doing a good job there and rather than uh, okay let's uh, cut the last few dollars and make it the cheapest we can Krish what are your thoughts? Sylvia, what do you think? Um, I, um, I think um, in the beginning of my uh, career, uh, I used uh, the APC quite a lot in this situation. And later when I got more experience, I used um, the soft coagulation with the tip of the, uh, of the snare. But um, I think that Roy convinced me um, that there are advantages in using APC in this situation. Salve. Hi, Raju. I do APC, Raju. That's just what I've done, and that's what I'm comfortable with. So that's that's what I do. I think I think you know the the goal is here. The goal is to uh, ablate the edge in a controlled manner uh, to have like a light, uh, it's a, it's a whitish brown appearance. So that will, that, that will give you enough uh, injury so that if there are cells that you can't see, you get rid of it. Uh, then you have to, that's the goal. The question is whether you can uh, safely uh, do this and, and control, uh, provide controlled depth of injury, either with a snare tip or with APC, uh, you have to think about how well can you control your scope and whether there is movement of the uh, area uh, should also be considered. You know, you know. So for, for me, even if you are a little bit a few millimeters away uh, for uh, somebody who is starting fresh, uh, uh, who may not have enough uh, scope tip control, uh, APC might be a little bit easier. And uh, uh, can I make also use the uh, uh, snare tip coagulation uh, when I know that I could actually achieve the same result as with APC? Sri Ram, comment. Can please. I make one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think I have to qualify my statement. And uh, I fully agree with uh, what you said. And uh, in fact, uh, what uh, Roy and uh, Roy said. And in fact, actual fact is that. Uh, I go by how uh, Sylvia made that comment. 
in the beginning yes i did use apc and uh, i i only switched over to soft coag as i uh, as things have evolved and uh, i certainly agree that uh, until one develops uh, that confidence in themselves and also according to the situation just because i have uh, a person cannot think that just because he or she has the expertise doesn't mean that they use it every time the same way a, a lot depends on the given situation and the and the the condition of the patient and the polyp and the position and all these things do come into the matter so i think those things have to be kept in mind at the end of the day patient care is most important thank you thank you sriram uh, alberto asked this question what's your opinion about prophylactic coagulation of non bleeding submucosal vessels so let me uh, go around and ask what each of the panelists think about. Roy, what would you do? I like that. I do it. I, 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 I usually do it. And how do you do that? I, uh, I think uh, to uh, do it safely, uh, we usually actually wash the surface. And uh, I think when you wash, then there is some more fluids going into the submucosa. And uh, you have a, a thicker and more cushion there. And then uh, I just use a uh, force coag and just lightly uh, uh, coagulate the visible vessels. If I see anything that's uh, pulsating, which is uh, possible, especially when you have something that's polypoid, uh, I would use uh, a clip rather than uh, coagulation. Uh, but there is also an advantage. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, it was... Uh, actually, it was cut in piecemeal. So there is also another advantage whereby when you uh, do this, uh, you uh, could also touch on the areas that you had done mm -hmm. uh, piecemeal okay. and that, then uh, you cut the, uh, the potential bridges. Right. Okay, that's good. So when you say wash the area, you mean to say you are going to wash that area with your water jet. Uh, pump, mm -hmm. not uh, just uh, flushing water through the biopsy port. Correct. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, Sylvia, what do you do? And I think uh, I, I would follow the same same steps as Roy described, and I would uh, I would try in the end to document as we have repeatedly talked uh, to document um, the resection place. So. Uh, to demonstrate that uh, uh, I have uh, treated, um, I have done the hemostasis appropriately, and um, there is no residual uh, tissue, residual adenoma. All right, straight down. Uh, I agree with what uh, Roy said. I, I recently I tend to use uh, uh, soft coagulation if I do see any vessel, uh, small vessels. Uh, but again, if it is pulsating vessel, I do try to use a clip and a lot depends on how it looks at the end of the uh, procedure. All right. So I think uh, Joseph has actually shared with the group. Uh, Michael Burke actually did a couple of studies, uh, one with the soft coagulation of the bleeding vessels or, or the submucosal vessels and also soft coagulation of the edge. Uh, there's no randomized trial comparing snare tip soft coagulation and APC of the edge to prevent recurrence. At least I don't know well, I don't know about any study comparing the two to prevent recurrence. Uh, when it comes to snare tip or soft coagulation of the vessels, uh, the literature is still uh, not there. A lot of people believe it makes a difference, uh, but uh, the data is not there in any randomized control study. All right. So this is what we did. We did APC uh, and uh, uh, for the sake of uh, the video, I, I just have uh, to show that uh, we did APC. I don't have the full video there. And then we close the defect with uh, clips. So would you close the defect with clips in this case, uh, Roy? I think I would, especially given the bleeding. 
And uh, I think I, I also feel that the surface was not uh, coagulated well. Uh, so I would be uh, more worried uh, and uh, I would just uh, close it. Lastly, of course, uh, because of the dis discussion, uh, because of the fact that the lesion is polypoid. So there, mm -hmm. there have been studies uh, using ultrasound uh, to show that lesions that are polypoid have a much larger uh, arterial and venous uh, vessels. Uh, so these are uh, the reasons. You actually had shown us uh, the stump of an artery uh, before. Uh, so uh, those are uh, the direct proof uh, that uh, these uh, kind of lesions have significant size vessels. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so a couple of uh, things that I would like to share with the group. Uh, we started with uh, Endocut Q313. You know, when I first started, I reached out to Michael Burke and uh, that was way back in early 2010 and asked him what he would do. And uh, that's the setting he was using. And uh, that's what I used for this case. But retrospectively, having learned a little more about electrosurgery and the settings at the end, the impact of each setting, uh, if I were to do this case uh, today, I would use FX3 like we did before, keep the duration at one, but uh, increase the interval to five or six, uh, not three. If by increasing the interval to five or six, I would get a, a lot more coagulation uh, in between the cuts and hopefully avoid uh, major bleeding. Uh, it's also interesting, it's just, an, uh, uh, just my observation. Uh, earlier in my career, I had a lot more bleeding and now I do have less bleeding by adjusting the settings. I don't use a 313 for every polyp. If I think there is a lot of meat to the polyp and maybe more vessels, bigger vessels to that polyp, I try to increase the interval and also uh, the way I close, I try to close a little bit slower for a large thick polyp. So something to keep in mind. The other one is when you want to close a defect, as you can see here, uh, the clips, you don't see any gap in between the two blades of the clip. And uh, that's what you need to do to apply a clip. If you have a gap, it is a more like a cosmetic application of the clip. That clip is going to fall off very quickly. And the second one is that clip will not have the mechanical tamponade effect that you would want to see there. So you want to apply the clip so that both blades uh, oppose and, uh, and uh, grasp and the tissue very deep. So that is one thing to keep in mind. And uh, in rectal lesions like this, you really don't need to put a tattoo. You know, uh, this is, uh, you can say, in relation to the first hostile fold or the second hostile fold, and you describe your lesion in that way, and the distance from the anal canal, uh, not, uh, not necessary to put a tattoo. You don't need to put a tattoo in the cecum either, uh, but anywhere above the rectum and above the cecum, you should put a tattoo. So we didn't put a tattoo and uh, I would let this thing go here. Uh, and uh, so we retrieved this polyp. Uh, one of the things you have to be careful when you retrieve this polyp is to make sure that your net doesn't uh, get caught up in the uh, clips. The other thing to keep in mind is if the lesion is very close to the anal canal, it is better to pick up a clip that has a very shorter stem uh, so that uh, the stems don't uh, poke on the hemorrhoidal vessels. Mm -hmm. So we actually followed this lady uh, for almost uh, at six months, a year and a half later. And uh, this is the scar. And fortunately she had no uh, recurrence. So I would like to leave it here and uh, open up, open it up for any comments or questions. And, and the histology of the lesion? 
Uh, yeah, you predicted it right, uh, Sylvia. It was a tubular villus adenoma. Uh, there was no cancer uh, okay. with a focal high grade dysplasia. So you predicted based on okay. your analysis of the surface pattern, uh, it was a tubular villus adenoma. And uh, it was good that, uh, you know, this was an adenoma, not a, a, a melanoma met. Mm -hmm. Any last minute comments, uh, Sridham? Good, sir, it is an excellent demonstration and uh, a very, very good discussion. Uh, the parts of uh, some of the discussion uh, is uh, uh, rarely available anywhere else uh, because uh, what is also appreciable in all this is uh, you willing to show the vulnerability side of it and discuss those things because those are the most important things for uh, for all of us and also as we go up up the ladder of training yeah we all learn i agree thank you so much raju for uh, thank doing so this. Much. thank all right. you so much nice all right. case all right thank you everybody i really appreciate I hope you have a nice weekend i really appreciate all you all of you coming down uh, alberto thank you uh, thank you so much if you could actually so you have gastric cancer cases Thank Perfect. You. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.